And right now, it's Hard Knock Radio, David D hanging out with you. We are in a nightclub, CBGB's, live here in New York City. And we are standing next to the Bronx Puerto Rican, a legend, one of hip hop's pioneers. We're talking about Prince Whipple Whip. How you doing, son? Yo, Lamp, and you already know, Dad. I'm cooling again. <laughs> you know, man, um, I just wrote this little article about you not too long ago. In fact, uh, the other day. We just wrote this article about you the other day because uh, I hadn't seen you on the mic in almost 15 years. I hadn't seen you since L.A. 1984 at a place called The Bush. But when you got up on the mic, one of the things that came to mind was how there are unsung heroes in the hip-hop game. And uh, and your particular contribution, um, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, would be the type of impact that Puerto Ricans in particular you know, their involvement and what they had on the game that we call hip-hop. What's your assessment of this? I mean, were you just one of a handful of Puerto Ricans, or were there a lot of folks like yourself that were blessing the mic back in the mid and late 70s? Actually, you know, it's wild to say, but there was like three. It was three of us. And on the microphone, it was Ruby D, myself, and man, I know he's gonna be mad at me, but I forget they name on Sugar Hill on Mean Machine. Right, Mean Machine, I remember them. Remember they they did that. And of course, you know we had DJs like Charlie Chase, the Disco Wiz. So there was really like there's a handful of individuals that I could mention, but literally on the microphone blessing at first was Ruby D, my member of the Mean Machine, myself. I mean, you, like right now you hear Puerto Rico Ho, and you think it's like who's that? That's us back in the '70s from a, a tape that somebody like you know took took from that and a lot of people don't know that yeah so it's like we're on other people's records everybody get paid for it but you know <laughs> lord look out i ain't mad at nobody but let me let me ask you this you know i mean aside from the uniqueness of just being puerto rican and on the mic um when i came up and i'm from soundview for people who don't know that's listening to me, the Fantastic Romantic Five, or just the Fantastic Five as y'all were then, you know, you always seem to, uh, I always saw a rivalry, even though I don't know if there was one between Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Four at that time, and I always saw these comparisons, because you both had dope DJs, you guys had Grand Wizard Theodore, there's Grandmaster Flash, but I had always expected the Fantastic Five to have been on to, to take it to that next level what happened was it a thing of being overshadowed or was it just wrong place wrong time what, what was the deal you know what it's like we really I don't know something happened in 82 83 when we did Wild Style after touring the world and coming back it, it was just like wow that was like the most incredible thing and I was like well I've done I've, you know, I've been around the world I've done everything now what's left and then that's in the beginning of the crack, you know, when New York was just beginning. Because back, back then, this, everybody was at the fever, everybody sniffing blow. Coke was a regular thing. Right. It wasn't taboo. So um, We're talking about the powdered stuff back then. Yeah, the powdered stuff. And then, you know, you get those who would cook it and want to get deep. And from there, you know what came out of that. So, right. so that stifled a lot of people's growth. Though. Uh, not only that, but uh, the wise ones, you know, said, hey, let me, let me get into something else. And try something else and make sure that I could provide later on, you know, because you don't know what the game is going to be like. Well, let me go back in the time a little. How did you guys hook up as an MC team? Dada Rock, Ruby D, yourself, uh, Master Rob, and then, of course, you know, Grand Wizard Theodore um, being on the wheel of steel. How did you guys come together? Well, it was actually mutual respect. Because they were L brothers. Theodore, Kevy Kev, Master Rob, and Chief Rocker Busy B were the L brothers. And back then, me and, um, wow, it's, it's a lot. Because back then, I was Cold Crush. I was me, Dr. Rob. You was a member of the Cold Crush? We originated the Cold Crush. That's what Cold, we started the Cold Crush. Ah, uh, see, I never knew that. Okay, okay. And it was, it was a, a you could say, a bit, not a conflict, but a business disagreement. In regards to, you know, Charlie Chase, in regards to the group, because me and Dada Rock were already together. We were salt and pepper. Right. We was, you know, before that, it was we were down with Grandmaster Kaz. It was DJ Kaz and the three MCs. So we were the treacherous trio, in which you hear Big Bang Hank spin on, you know, treacherous trio, be proving the joints. So, I mean, that was before that. So it's like, I'm going reverse. So to start it all off, I'm a seed from Grandmaster Kaz. You know what I'm saying? Because I started out with him. He was the DJ, I was the MC. So it was DJ Casanova Fly, MC Whip a Whip. 
It wasn't even no Prince then. <laughs> you know, I, I never knew that out of all the years, you know, coming up. I never knew that. We've never did no real in-depth interview. It's like, this, this, we could do a movie. A straight up documentary with the original people. We unfortunately we can't get everybody, but I mean we had a coalition right now with Cass, Herc, Bam, myself, one Lions member of Legends, one member. Well, CEO, Coalition and Empowerment of Hip Hop. It's you know one guy from every group, you know the baddest, and sometimes two, you know because we got Raheem, Ellie Mel, you know Cass from Cold Crush, me from Fantastic. So and we just we putting it together and yo everybody just got to look out because look we form Voltron whenever needed I mean you know to put it in layman's terms kind of like you know so people can visualize a guy from a different group and everybody getting together just doing one crazy old school show so that's what and, and that's that's definitely needed because I mean right now everybody's going back into time and starting to unearth things. And, uh, you know, like I said, when I seen, when I heard that you was at the uh, place the other night, I was like, oh, snap, man, I ain't seen dude in a long time. But, you know, um, you know, going back to this whole thing, though, you know, like I said, as much as I pride myself on hip-hop knowledge and I was on that scene, I never knew you all came out of Cold Crush. Yeah, we started you know? Cold Crush. Okay. I mean, we I sat down, we had, we was thinking of the name, you know what I mean? And we just got it together. It was Tony Tone, Charlie Chase, to give you the original members. T-Bone, which is named Mr. T, uh, Teddy Ted, Dada Rock, myself, and Easy AD. Now, you know, my history goes back with you and Dada Rock being Salt and Pepper. Right. You know, and maybe you can speak on that, um, because I always tell people there was a Salt and Pepper before the female Salt and Pepper. So how did that form, and what was that about? Well, I mean, back when I was with Kaz, back then we'd rock a whole night. And what I mean by we doing a party, that means from 9 o'clock to like 4 or 5 in the morning, it's Kaz on the wheels of steel. He has somebody to back him up like A1 DJ Mighty Mike or the Disco Wiz. But on the microphone, it was just me by myself. And you know, and we literally would rock all night long. You know how we used to do back in the day. We'd stop like around 12 o'clock, slow it down some slow music. Come 1 o'clock, it's really time to tear that shit right. up. I think folks nowadays don't really appreciate and understand the meaning of endurance. Oh, it took it took a lot. We've been we've been man been through it all. So then we had to get I had to like yo we, I need a partner. And sure enough, we was looking around and uh, at that time it was MC. His name was Dotty Dot. <laughs> really? Okay. You know, so we, I interviewed a bunch of brothers. We test put you know have them play some beats down the A1 DJ Mighty Mike script and we just had auditions. And Dot stood out, you know, and then we would be everywhere. We'd hit the lab, we just would write. And I don't know how we just clicked to where we would just, we do the like inner thing, you know what I mean? Nice. We do yeah, each other's so call and response. And you know, it was like, whoa, it was butter. So we clicked. And then Mean Gene from the L Brothers were like, yo, man, y'all guys, every time I see y'all, y'all together, y'all just like salt and pepper. We looked at each other, we were like, salt and pepper, that's this shit. And from then on, we started writing salt and pepper routines. Well, if you hear a lot of salt and pepper routines now, from when they first started, like shake that thing and all that, those are our old routines. That's straight from that's straight from Wild Style. That's straight from a cassette. My mic sound nice, check one. You know my mic sound nice. That's a Fantastic Five routine. That's salt and pepper routine, our original shit. Well, you know that's the other thing I wanted to ask you, um, and this goes back to my first question about being overshadowed. Um, I always knew the Fantastic to do routines. Mm -hmm. We also knew Flash to do root oh, yeah. to do routines. A lot of those routines have become foundations for groups today. Sure. Um, how do you guys feel about it? Because, as you said, as you pointed out, people have made whole songs, mm -hmm. have built careers off it, and uh, you know, when you go to certain parts of the country, people are actually using the routines word for word oh, yeah. and trying to pass them off. So, I mean, what has happened? I mean, what? I mean, is it? it do you harbor a bitterness, a, a sadness, a regret? I mean, obviously, back in the days, nobody knew. What we called hip hop was going to be what it is today, but still, you know, it's got to, it's got to touch a chord when you see your routines being done. Well, yeah, there's two answers to that. The first one would be for those who do, who didn't know, then there's nothing I can say, but you know, they they know they they know good shit when they hear it, so they gonna want to spit it. But, but for those who do know, and then don't even like. Any, give any type of recognition. There's a few groups out there I could mention. And I mean, they straight up. There's one group that I give props to, and that's Jurassic 5. Because uh, DJ Akil, he seems to, uh, me and him seem to be really cool. And Charlie Tuna, he, they butter. But when I hit them, you know, it, it's so great to know that, you know, they came from us. 
and that they spit it and let it know, like, you know, let it be known like that. So I give them props. As far as anybody, you taking some stuff, you know, what can you say, man? Everybody gets everything taken. What can you say about that? <laughs> you know, um, one of the things that is also interesting and unique, uh, well, there's two things. One, I, also, I see you, uh, Africa Islam, um, Curtis Blow, a couple other cats are being uh, the first wave after Bambada to go out to Los Angeles. And when you touched down in LA, you were touching down at a time that hip hop was starting to really take hold there. Were you a part of that early scene? What were your thoughts on it and comparing it between New York and then being a part of the LA scene and a place called the Bush? You know, <laughs> well, see, that, that was the thing. The bush here, water the bush, and then, well, wow, man, that was a mouth, that's a lot. <laughs> um, we, we touched down, when did we touch down? When I touched down to LA, damn, I was one of the first. There was, hand, it was Ice, I hooked up with Ice. Ice had just did the record, I think he did a record called um, Six in the Morning. And he had that record out, and I was like, and it was a sheer coincidence the way we met. Because I was giving a, a, you know, I called up the radio and I wanted to give a shout out to my my first wife. And I was like, yeah, yeah, Valerie, yeah, Prince Whip a Whip. And the guy was like, who's this? I was like, Whip -a, from Whip a Whip. The nigga said, hold on for a sec. And uh, he came back, somebody else came on the phone and they're like, yo, who this? I said, yo, I want to give a shout out to my wife. You know, it's Whip a Whip. They did a fantastic father. like, yeah. He said, nigga, come here, man. You just hand G, man. You got to come down to the radio station, yo. It's like da da da. Because, I mean, I, we never been out there. I mean, we were one time, but, but after that. So, um, I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't think about it, you know. I'm like, I go to the station. I met up with Ice. He was a cool dude. Uh, it was KDAY. It was Greg Mack's show. It was the Mix Masters show. So, it was Hen G and Tony G and all them boys. And they were doing a radio tron out there. And I was like... Shit just reminded me of like the grill here in New York and all the like the art galleries we did out here. Because at that time you had a lot of white boys that was also getting into it at that time. Of course, the full circle of hip hop. We had a lot of graph artists, you know, skateboarders. But um, it was real wild because we came out and I just started touring. Houdini would come down, wherever they, you know, show. We did it all over. All, oh, we did Knott's Berry Farm, okay? <laughs> and so uh, we just started traveling with ice, and from then we just we that we started the bush, and you know we would say hey let's bring some New York out here because there ain't no New York out here, and once we did that we we were the first to come up with like the the club with the three rooms you know we had the reggae room we had the reggae band and the reggae DJ in the reggae room we had a boom for rock and rollers to play rock we had, and then the big main floor for hit hardcore hip hop and so was this around '86 because I thought I saw you in '84. I was out there way before then. I was there. Yeah, because it had to be 84. I was out there. We did Wild Well, we was out there Wild Side. I was 83. That was 83, 84. Okay. And then we went out. It was probably like 85, 86. The Bush started 87. After Islam came out, because he started DJing for Ice and making beats and producing, uh, Donald T came out. Gordy B came out. And let's see what, what we do. Oh, man. The Bush just turned out to be the most incredible thing in Hollywood. It was like, it was a Tuesday night. Nobody threw parties on Tuesdays, like it's unheard of. And we'd make like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a Tuesday night. Wow. Every week. Every week for years. It was incredible. So what has happened that Whip a Whip hasn't really touched down and do his own records? I, I was under the impression that when uh, Ice-T had formed... Um, uh, his uh, record label, remember when he got signed to your Rhyme Syndicate, that people like yourself were going to come out underneath him. That seemed to be the plan, talking to Ice, but then it just never materialized. So how come you never went solo? Um, Actually, I did. I, I finished two albums, a Spanish one and an English one. Really? When's the Spanish one? It's called um, Latigador, which is whip in Spanish. <laughs> so this is new? Yeah. Uh, okay, so now you're coming out with some stuff. Yeah. So what's the name of that album again? Latigador. And then the English joint is ain't nothing changed but the waistline. <laughs> okay, so you did step back into the game. Yeah. But you know, it's interesting, you have it in Spanish because when, when I remember seeing Fantastic, I didn't hear you rap in Spanish. You are Ruby D. why not? 
Never thought of it. <laughs> it didn't really like, you know, it didn't really hit me. It hit me when I came, I went to Cali and um, we did a show. It was a Cinco de Mayo show. I'll never forget this. And I wrote a record off of Santana. I did it with Hen G, Tony G, back then. Cause I was like, yo, all these Mexicans, like, we need some Spanish shit out this month. Nobody was doing it. It was unheard of. So then I wrote a joint to Oye Como Va, which was Santana's Oye Como Va. And I, I called it, listen to how it goes. And I performed this song with me, it was just myself and my three dancers. I had two females and a guy dancer. And they, it was a big thing. They sent us like six limos. There's only four of us. <laughs> you know? And we just had the, the, it was just a great blowout. And it was a single of the mile thing. And Kid Frost was there. And so, you know, I did my whole show. We did the show. Um, I did my Spanish joints, my two last Spanish joints, because it's Cinco de Mayo. I had to do something in Spanish. So um, the crowd went berserk, and me and Frost hooked up. Now, he rocked, but he didn't do a he was All his shit was straight English. And so he was like, I seen him. He was like, and one morning he came to my crib. I'm in Hollywood. Off of, We off of Cass was living in the same building. We were on uh, Sunset and um, Kingsley, because we used to call ourselves the Kings of Kingsley. And, um, well, I was knocking boots, so I'm going to tweet it to you real. He came to the, door, to the door, and I was like, yo, what's up? He's like, yo, I need you to hear something. I said, go ahead, just play it through the window, you know. So he came, he played this shit. And I'm like, yo, say it here. He played me La Raza, just the music. And I was like, yo, you put some of that Spanish up in there, you're winning. He came up, and when we finished that shit in the studio, the shit was the bomb shit. And, to, and the, so to me, Frost was the first one to, like, kick in. Because, I mean, he had all the Mexicans. He was Mexican. So that's what I thought Tony G was more of an influence at that he time. Was. And, you know, that goes He's back. He's the one that did the song, the track for me. Listen to how it goes. But, you know, the question that comes to mind, did you see a difference between, say, the Mexicans and the hip-hop that they were doing and you being Puerto Rican and they the type of... They were doing nothing. They didn't know any. They were doing all English shit. I ain't never saw nobody. After, after Frost did that one song, and he took it to another level. He took it to, yo, Kit Frost where he took it to and that was a great thing but in all the magazines I, I like the props and all of that shit you know he flip it and he my daughter as a matter of fact he's on he produced three of the songs that I'm doing Tony G or Kid Frost uh, Kid Frost okay okay what, what, why didn't you all hook up back then yourself um I don't know I really don't know no reason actually see because I keep coming back to those questions in terms of um Looking at some of the uniqueness that, that I saw the Latin community have, like Tony G, I always give Tony G credit with coming up with the fast scratch. You know, that a lot of people based, based uh, their turntablism off of, so that's kind of unsung. Um, but he I, also put that rap group together too. What's them girl's name? Supersonic? Oh, JJ Fad. Yeah, JJ Fad. Uh, that was Tony G's project. I didn't know that because they made it seem like it was Dre. Nah, nah, nah. That was Tony G and this kid named uh, Mixmaster Trick from San Diego. Right. Sulu King. What about uh, Julio G and all those guys? Julio G was a Mixmaster. He was spinning. Julio was spinning. Tony spinning. Um, what's that guy? Uh, um, Eminem, Eminem, what's his name? Eminem? Eminem? Emwak, I'm oh, sorry. Emwak, yeah, I'm that's sorry. my boy Emwak, okay. Yeah, Emwak, who is with uh, Tony, um, um, gosh, uh, Tone Loke. Right, Tone Loke's DJ, Emwak. Right, 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 right again. So then, it's like, we always got together at times and do tours and concerts, like, it would be Tone Loke, Ice, me, and we go to Mexico, we in Tijuana rocking, you know, stuff like that, when Wild Thing was hot. So... You can, you can picture the time and era, but uh, most of the West Coast brothers were real cool. I mean, I wore red everywhere I went. I was highly accepted by the Booyah tribe, but I really didn't realize how crazy that shit was. Right. I had guns pulled on me. And brothers really? Walked, brothers walked up on me and, wow, man, it was like, okay, this is L.A., but I'm going to still hold my shit down. I still wear red. <laughs> Not because I'm a gang, man, because that's my favorite color, yo. Right, right. I wear blue, too. Okay. Sick. So that had to definitely be a big difference coming out from New York and dealing with the whole politics in L.A. Yeah, but we made our own world. Okay. When we did United Nation, we did our own thing. It was you know now what was United Nation? I forgot about all that. That came right after Water the Bush. Okay, that was the, that was the club right after. Yeah. So that had to be like what ninety two? Let me see. No, this was ninety. Ninety. Because we went to Japan. We went okay. to Japan in ninety also. Okay. And I had to go to. I'll never forget. I had to go in the middle of while things were hot. 
right. we were at Mr. J's on Sunset. We had to move from Hollywood Hollywood Boulevard, Hollywood Live, and that's that was the place. That place had five floors of the greatest. Right now it's owned by Disney, so Universal. Right. So if Universal got it, you know it was a fly right. spot. Wait, so th I remember there was United Nation, there was Waters Bush, and then there was also um, Paradise. That was on right. Thursdays. That you know? was now Paradise was that fly Cali stuff. Right, that was the more bougie, uh, bougie. Thing. Where you had to wear this and that to come in the door. You know how much money you lose like that? I understand you want to separate the riffraff, but you got to remember too, like if your security's on point, you ain't never got to worry about your club. Right. Never. We had the Booyah tribe as security, and they were walking around with Uzis. You know, and so that's why we got kicked out of Hollywood Live. <laughs> Things got out of hand. <laughs> so let me ask you this, you know, um, is there any chance of bringing back the Fantastic Romantic Five? And when did you all put the name Romantic into it? Because I have taste when it was just the Fantastic Five. That's how far back I go. So it was like when I seen the Wild Style, I think then it was like the Romantic. No, in fact, then we called yourself the Romantic Freaks. And I was like, you know, that ain't that ain't these guys on the tape. Where, where did that come in? What happened on that? I'll tell you where that got, <laughs> we got spoiled. That came on a Sugar Hill tour. When we came back, we were freaks, yo. We were hanging out, and I give it up to it was Melly Mel, Scorp, and the Furious. Because, you know, we were in the same tour bus together. So, you know, when you're in the bus together, you're like, wow, we were like rival groups. You know what I mean? But we was also down. We only battled one time. But I give it to them because Scorpio, that's my nigga. He's the biggest freak I know. So they were Formerly freaks. Mr. Ness. Freaks. That's right. Hey, my brother. I, I, I love that brother. I love Mel. We like, you know what I'm saying? Right. You know, one of the things, did you guys get Flash and, uh, and Fantastic ever battle? Once we most certainly did at the T Connection. Okay, and this is the one where Melly went off, right? If I remember this correctly, this is when Melly had a field day. Well, Mel always has a field day. He Melly. But this was one time where he stepped it up. If I'm remember, if I remember that correctly. You're not talking about the the at the Ritz, right? No, it was at the T Connection. It was at the T Connect. The tape exists. They did it. They did their routine. They did a badass routine. It wasn't Mel. They he didn't really like. The way you saying it, I'm trying to picture it. I know if Mel went off like that, but they they won it. Okay, <laughs> we well, lost. Right, you know, and, and and then of course the legendary battle that everybody knows is in 1981 between you guys and the Cold Crush. That's why I was confused. Like I didn't know y'all came out of the Cold Crush. Let's go on. This is how that started. When Dada Rock and myself left, cause we were Salt and Pepper. We didn't want no more other MCs. You know, it was like, yo, Chase, man. Salt and Pepper, man. And he was like, yo, I can't do it. You know, I can't put my, let my boys down. So it was like, you know, it's business. That's when we stepped up to Theodore. And out of respect, we went to Mean Gene. It was, went to, I remember we went to Rock City. And we was like, yo, what's up? We want to be there. We want to put something together. And they were like, you know, we know who y'all is. But y'all niggas going to have to rock the mic for us right now. No problem. I mean, that started doing our salt pepper routines. By the time we were done, niggas was like, yo, we got to talk. Bam, we had meetings. We set up dates. Now, when me and Dot left and joined Fantastic, we had to change the name. Right. And uh, JDL and Kaz got, took our slots up in Cold Crush. Okay. And so there was always a rivalry because, I mean, I'm from Kaz. And I left Kaz, and here we are with a hard charger group. We both both crews had parties back to back. We were doing two and three nights in one night, two or three gigs in one right, night, right. three four nights days. a week. It was like wow, man. You know, the, but the money was great. You know, and here we are, kids. No, no. How, much, how much money would you night? say you always pulling in? I mean, let's go. Let's let's put the dividing line. Prior to Sugar Hill coming out with a record, how much money would you say as an MC you were bringing home? That was very little. <laughs> that was usually like 90 bucks that was at most, right? After, because because the DJ always got paid. Because I was, paid. yeah, because I was in a crew myself. So yeah. the good thing about us is we had Kevy Kev, and boy, you don't want to talk to Kev when come talk of my money. <laughs> All right? Promoters hate to see water bed coming. The water bed come out. I'm like, look, there's six of us, and we ain't trying to hear it. We got the count at the door. Just give us our money. We ain't trying to hear Jack. So we always try to get anywhere from 75 to like $200 a head minimum. And so most of the time, we only get 75 to $100. $600 was like going rate until we started but did doing you, the did you Did you all promote your own, or who were some of the early promoters that did it with you? Uh, we had Armstrong. We had uh, uh, Ray Chandler, who did all the Black Door Productions. They were Flash's old manager. But we had, we had um, 
Man, dip like we had. Uh, oh man, what's my boy name? I can't forget his name. Van Silk. Van Silk. You know what I mean? So we call him Can Milk. But anyway, um, about that that hand few plus some more took us all over the city. We was doing. What, what would you say was your favorite spot to uh, to to really get down at? I had two favorite spots: the T Connection and Harlem World. Okay. Either one of those spots is a toss-up. Harlem World because it was Manhattan, and we was like, okay, now we're gonna see dressed-up girls. We're in the Bronx, you see them thug girlies, you know, you know what I mean? It was like now we get to see the honey. So to me, because I mean, Richard T was cool. We'd go behind the bar, make our own drinks. So that's the kind of thing, you know. And then another thing is that that's the place that we partied the night before we filmed the basketball scene in Wild Style. Right. Okay. So we were up all night long till morning, waiting for sun. I had to wet the ball, you know, court, so you blousing the ball on wet ground and getting on, man. And you know that, this is like th certain things you just can never forget. Right. You know, one of the things that comes to mind also is um, going back to those days, a lot of times I see people look at people like Puffy. And they'll go, oh man, you know, those guys are materialistic and they're trying to dress all fly and, and all that. Maybe you could describe for our listeners that there was a whole get fly and if you want to call it jiggy, we didn't call it jiggy back in the days. But, I mean, you had to come with the, with the Lee Jeans pressed and, you know, go to Delancey Street and get your gear. So has that always been a part of hip-hop in your opinion? Yeah, well, I mean, but just look at me now. I've been fly from day one. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's just like what we turn into freaks, yo. It's just the females were just mobbers. It was like, yo, you know, it's, it's, I feel fortunate to know what it feels like to run literally through a stadium and have your clothes ripped off by females and seeking protection and shit like that. That's some incredible shit, <laughs> you know, so. And you guys were just starting to experience it just when doing the, the early party. Yeah, we were just regular guys, yo. We weren't nobody, but to them, we were like, oh, because it's wild style. And they're like, whoa. So to this day, we go to Japan and Europe, they call us heroes. You know, so Wild like, Style wow. really took it to the next level for you. Yeah, Wild Style, Wild Style has really been a milestone just for the fact that it's it's a it's a documentary, it's a piece of history that you can't erase, you can't change it or put your own version to it. That's the way it was, and you you were able to see how shit really was in its rarest, rawest form. Now you know the only record that ever came out with Fantastic was the one that uh, Aaron Fuchs put out. On um, on Tough City. Tough City. What was that nah, about? That was, we did that. That was on a label called uh, Soul on Wax. The Soul Clap record. Okay, because Aaron Fuchs, he said he or he had the only one. So what what was that about? Aaron Fuchs bought it off of Johnny Soul. Our old manager sold us out. That's why our group broke up. It was like, yeah, man, it was we was we was stranded to a messed up contract. And there was nothing we can do. I was like, I I left. That's when I left. I left in 83. I'll never forget. September of 83. And from that point on, Fantastic really never really did much more. And that's why you hear a lot about the Cold Crush, because they were next in line. See, all the battles. Furious between. It was only Furious, Fantastic, and Cold Crush. Literally, on the battle tip. So, Furious always had first place, and Cold Crush always wanted to battle us for second place, but they never won. So, what about my boys from the Crash Crew? Mike and Dan. On. Oh, Break of Day Productions. Definitely nice. They had Manhattan sewn up. They were good. That's way after the fact, though. Okay. By that time, I was like, I was out of the game. I, I left the game. I, I said, if it was meant to be, it's, it's going to be meant to be. But I was looking at before Sugar Hill, so we're talking about 78, 79, those years with all the crews. How would you rate them before and after Wild Style? Well, there wasn't that many groups on Wild Style. There was I some mean, I mean old. before and after the movie came out. Because after the movie oh. came out, everybody got into the game again. But prior to that, oh, look, there was look, just a hand. Look, look at Run DMC. They, they would double, look at Double Trouble. What Run DMC do? Exact same thing Double Trouble were doing. What was Double Trouble doing? Salt and pepper routines. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Back and back with the integrated up. That was Whip and Whip and Dada Rock. That was us. We started that. We did that. And there it is. And to the, I remember the first concert we did with Run, too. He never really did want to look me in the eye too tough. And then our, our posses got into conflict. 
And ever since then, he's like, yeah, yeah, what's up, what's up? But then, you know, he'll keep his distance, like, you ain't messing with them niggas because they crazy, you know? And I really had no animosity or nothing like that because that's not my heart, you know? That, that's not in me, never was. But, you know, when Run DMC first came out, they used to take shots on their record. There would be subtle disses, you know, about old school and all that. And, you know, unless you was from that time, you it would go over your head. But I always peeped it out. So was that directed towards, I always thought it was directed towards Melly Melanin, but was that perhaps being directed towards the Fantastic? Nah, I, I don't, to this day, nah, I don't know who the hell Ron was talking about. You know, and that goes to show that we really didn't care. Because it's like, as far as I'm concerned, what we did, you know, no one else ha can do because it's already been done. And then, but well, I give thanks to them because they took hip hop to another level. They gave hip hop new life, new meaning. That's a great thing. So if they did, I doubt it. I, I doubt if it, you know, I doubt if it was anybody of us. It could have been somebody around his block. It just blew up and happened to go out that way. But I, it was quite sure. I, I know what somebody had to do the music industry. I ain't saying, but you know. <laughs> yeah, so lastly, you know, um, what what has happened with the rest of the group? I see Theodore around from time to time, um, but what happened to the other members? You know, um, Theodore, he's still he, Theodore's playing music. He's still he's do, he's just coming out with an album right now. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a song on his album. What's the name of his album? I don't even know. Okay. It's 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 done all by DJs though. Okay. So it's like I I feel you know privileged to be an MC on it because it's all a DJ thing, like a remix type situation. Um, Got a rock, hardworking man. He about the same job today he's had since high school. Which is? Uh, I, I don't want to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's his business, whatever you want to tell it. It's a great job. It's not bad. It's a great job. But the guy's been at the same job for over 23 years. Wow. You know what I'm saying? I'm but like... I, I'm like, wow, you know, <laughs> he ready to retire. He could, he could have retired already. Right. After working, 20 years, he, he could work. Right. He, he liked to work, and I mean, for the same job for that long, I'm like, wow, man. And uh, Ruby D, he in Florida, got nine kids, so he's like, if it ain't no money involved, y'all ain't gonna see me. <laughs> Master Rob and Waterbed, they in the Bronx, they not into the music as much. They like really not into it and the only reason I have been is because I've been one of the lucky ones to, to my voice is the same so people trip because I'm still I, yeah, like I said that's why I say ain't nothing changed but the waistline you know and it, our thing was always about um, projecting your voice and letting people understand what you're saying and, and you know you don't really have, you know that was our main thing right and it seems like a lot of MCs don't do that anymore um, and maybe you could speak on that, the importance of showmanship. Uh, for example, I've run into a lot of new cats today, and they pride themselves on being able to uh, think of rhymes off the top of their head. And I go, you know, most of the cats, when we came up, I have my rhyme books to this day. I mean, everybody wrote their rhymes, and it wasn't a, wasn't a question of memorize. It wasn't a question of coming off the top of your head. It was a question of projecting and moving the crowd. To, I used to come up my dome all the time. Cats say, this is the event of the tip right here. Cats give me credit for it, you know, but I mean, I used to love doing, I used to love freestyling, because right. it was a, it was just something that I was blessed with, actually. So you did mostly freestyle, or did you do a lot of written? No, we wrote. We had, you had to write. See, that's the good thing about doing freestyles. Freestyles are kind of like the interludes to your, to your work. So, of course, it was like, we did it with finesse. I'd, I'd have my routines. Perfect example. I haven't seen, I was in L.A., and I haven't seen Melly Mel in over, let's say, 14 years. We both have a gig in Japan. African Islam is like, yo, I got you and Mel. He, he, he mails us both the cassette. We listen to the cassette. I meet Mel in LA. He comes to the, we meet up at the airport. He has a layover and we get on the same plane. On that plane, we wrote our routines. We, for every song is had, we had to sit there and we had a two hour show of him doing his routines, me doing my, we never seen each other in 15 years. We got together, we'll say, all right, we'll use this hook here, and we'll use this hook there, and we did an entire two hour show with number hardcore beats with Africa Islam, and it was a fantastic thing. Right. So, the, in, the, the interludes would be what, you know, you'd have to freestyle and flip to the top of the cup to, to, so Iz can get ready, because we never did anything together. So it would be kind of like jazz. You have a theme, yeah. and you work around it. Exactly, and you build on it. But, I mean, we had run. <laughs> it would be like, all right, now this is where you put, you put in 24 bars, and then I put, we'll, we'll do, I'll put in 24 bars, and then we'll get, like, eight bars of holes, and then you do another 15 bars, 
See, we like, you know, we were doing, we were doing like half records. Shit that would, uh, the average individual would have a hard time doing something like that and pre being pressured in a situation like that. Because we had two days rehearsal before the show. Wow. So that's cool. So once again, that that's the uh, advantage of writing. And, and, and having to deal with the art of showmanship. And showmanship. Definitely showmanship. Like you was talking about back in the days wearing the gear. You have to be fly. Come on. You, you didn't want to stand out. You don't want to be yeah, like that. But you guy. guys had the costumes and did the dance steps and all that. Oh, people yeah. would, people don't think that's a part of hip-hop. Can you speak on that? That is part of hip-hop. It sure is. We had the tuxes. We had the dance routines. Of course. You know what I mean? I, I, it's just incredible. Like, I'm in the five heartbeats. You don't know this. I'm in the five heartbeats, though. <laughs> uh, and, and, and to see what they did, the way they uh, uh, the old groups that they were portraying, it's like it, it just it's, we see it seems like that's us because I mean that's where it came from, but I mean we were like that's what it, you know it felt the same way the the whole movie is like it's about you but I'm in the choir by the way at the end I'm wearing gold frames you can check it out are you really in the five part beats yeah <laughs> no kidding yeah so I'm in Hollywood you know I was doing the SAG thing. Oh, okay, so I didn't know you was in other movies. Just that one or uh, other? I was in that, and I was in some other stuff. I don't even remember the names of You know how you just, you go, yeah, I'm a SAG member, so I'm doing extra work. I was in all kind of stuff. Man, I better put my card in for the SAG thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? It cost a quite Yeah, it's a grip.